Hello and welcome back and today I want to talk to you guys about Synology High Availability or SHA. Now I have talked to big game over the years about dual controller interfaces. That is a NAS generally in rack mount that has uh, two CPUs, two motherboards, two sets of memory, two sets of ports, two PSUs etc etc. It ultimately gives you the ability to have a complete redundant system that in the event that your primary NAS breaks another one is there to pick up the slack, a uh, short transition and then you're able to carry on accessing all of your data. But a number of you aren't aware that SHA can be conducted with desktop devices. It's not necessarily restricted to these high-end 3, 4, 5, and even up to 10 grand rack mount devices. Now, today I want to show you guys how to set up a Synology high availability setup. We're going to be utilizing two DS920s that I've already set up in advance, and I'm going to go through every step of the way on how to set up these devices. But a few disclaimers straight off the bat. First and foremost, this is not an active active setup. For those that aren't aware, an active active setup is when you have two NASes that are simultaneously reading and writing the data at the same time and the drop between them if one fails is considerably shorter. Also an active active setup can often allow one user to take advantage of the hardware resources of both systems rather than them acting as parity of one another and now not allowing you to use both of them. In the case of desktop SHA setups, we have a passive and active relationship, with the active being the primary NAS and the passive being a secondary copy of everything that goes on with the first. And in the event of a failure of connection, then all services will be ported over to the passive device, which does take longer than an active active setup, but does ultimately allow you to still have a safety net. Now, for these 920s that we're utilizing today, I am utilizing a um, two uh, four bay systems here. If we go into the info center on each of them, we're able to see that they're both DS920s. They are both utilizing the same CPU and Although they are similar, it's worth highlighting that there is more memory in the primary, and that is something I will touch on later on. On top of that, both of them have got two Synology H80-5300 hard drives inside. So if we go ahead and create it there, we're able to see they've both got two drives inside in the same base, both of them at the same capacity, both of them have got the same storage port inside a RAID 1 environment, and both of them have got a BTRFS storage port inside that's exactly the same between them. Now, the reason they have to be identical is it's going to be very, very tough to create a Synology high availability environment where one device is a safety net if the safety net or the primary are completely different to the other. So we've connected both of these devices. They're on the same version of DSM. They're both on the same local area network uh, band, as you see, 192.168.1, but they've got different IPs, one different. So when you've got these two set up, it's worth remembering that you do want to make sure these are also connected by something called a heartbeat. Now, a heartbeat is when not only do you have a local, um, you know, a local connection via RJ45 or whatever, to your switch or network environment, but you also have another one that connects both NASes together. And again, that is still using RJ45, which means Synology high availability means your NAS has to have at least two LAN ports in order for them to establish that heartbeat connection. Finally, make sure you've got high availability set up and installed on both devices. And by that, I mean the application itself, ready and available from the package center. Just scroll down, you'll find it in the S's. Just go ahead and install that free app. So now you've got it installed on both of these devices, we can go ahead and start building our high availability environment. Make sure that all the actions you commit right now are going to be on the primary NAS. This is the NAS that is going to be considered the first NAS, the one that's either got the data on it already that you don't want to lose, or ultimately the device that is going to be the primary NAS. Try to go for the one that you think is the newest of the two if you're going to go for a primary NAS, but I'm going to be utilizing the one on the left, the one ending on IP143, but we will be changing that IP later. So go ahead and start your high, high availability cluster, and it will then ask you to check compatibility, uh, network interfaces, and more, basically covering everything I've said so far. Then click Next. It will also advise you to make sure that one LAN port is connected to the network, otherwise known as the cluster connection. 
that is the identity of this uh, SHO that we're creating, and the heartbeat, which is that cable connection between both NAS devices. Once you've got those connected, don't worry about getting the right one, because it will invite you to make sure um, afterwards that you select the right ones for your setup. Make sure, of course, that LAN 1 on both devices is the same. So if you're using your um, LAN 1 to connect as a heartbeat connection, make sure the same LAN connection or LAN 1 is used on both devices. So in my case, you can look at both of the connections. But given that they're both connected, how do we distinguish between them? Easily. Go to the control panel, head into the network settings, from here, go into Network Interfaces, and using your IP at the top of the screen, find which one of these is that IP. In this case, 192.168.1.143, same one up here. So that is the cluster network, LAN 2. So if we go into the cluster interface, we make sure to select LAN 2. And therefore, the heartbeat connection between the two NASes has to be LAN 1. Go ahead and click Next, and from there, it's going to look for the other NAS on the local area network in order to establish connection between this active server that we're working on with the passive or secondary server that we're using as our safety net. As you see, it's found the passive server, and from here, it will ask the login information for this NAS server. Don't worry, this will change later, but for now, I'm already going to go with the one that we've already created. From there, click Next. And now it will begin the process and the checks in the background of this SHA connection to ensure that these two can communicate. From here, it's now going to ask us to give the cluster a name. I'm going to call this one Synology Cluster. Not imaginative, but it does the job. Next, you have to give this device an identity on the IP. Now, make sure that you use an IP that's not already on the network. So, obviously, it's you can start with 192.168.1, but after that, you have to give it a new identity. So, in my case, I'm going to give it the identity 120. So, we go there. It's now telling me it's the incorrect value. That's no, fine. Um, from there, click Next, and it will start checking, one, that this identity is not already on the network, but also double-checking that this IP can be established between the two of them. Now, before we go any further, I should have touched on earlier, in the network interfaces, make sure that your IP is not dynamic or using DHCP. Um, Synology High Availability Setups require the identity of your NAS on the network to never move. If you have DHCP, it means that your IP address can fluctuate as devices move around your network, are connected, and also factoring in Wi-Fi connections too. So make sure to go into the network setting. If DHCP is clicked as yes, go into edit, and make sure that you use a manual configuration. You can still maintain the same IP that you're using already, but just make sure it is a manual connection. So from there, coming out of both of them, we can go and click Next to begin the creation of the Synology cluster and verifying all the decisions we've made so far. It's now going to go through all of the requirements and double-checking that they're all correct. As you see, the system information, the volume information, and the network services have all been ticked A-OK. -okay. They're all on the same network. They've both got the same volumes and storage pool. They're both using the same NAS, and even the network setup is near enough identical, both being static IPs. It's then checking the heartbeat interface between these two devices, verifying that they're both utilizing the same LAN port on the identical NASes, and making sure that both of them can still transmit at the at least 100 megabits per second. Of course, if you are using a 10 GBE NAS, it's worth highlighting that 10 GBE can also be used for the heartbeat connection and can be very advantageous for larger file transmissions overall. Now, do you remember earlier on when I mentioned the memory being higher on the primary than the secondary? When we click Next, it's now going to let us know that it's noticed the physical memory on the primary NAS here, um, the active server, the, one nine, uh, the 920 uh, version 1, is higher. That doesn't stop us using SHA, but it's worth highlighting that 
in the event that we switch over to the passive server, if we are using services that take advantage of larger amounts of memory, these may be affected. I've left that memory in there just to show you that the system will take this into consideration, but nevertheless will highlight that insufficient memory on the secondary server can be problematic. Next, it will ask you, do you want to create a brand new file cluster creation, or do you want to keep all the existing data on your NASes. Now bear in mind if you have mapped network drives, if you have LUN targets already set up, if you have shares and accounts, chances are you do want to keep all of that data. It will take longer to create the high availability environment but ultimately it will carry the data over. Just do bear in mind that once this operation is completed the new IP on this cluster on the network is going to be the one we created earlier so this may affect existing shared folders that you have outside of the NAS itself. So bear in mind that when creating this new cluster, in my case ending in the IP120, that it may change the identity of your existing shares and these may need updating. For the sake of this video however, and to keep things nice and quick, I'm going to go ahead and erase all the data and therefore not have to worry about it all being carried over. But again, if you do want to keep all of your data that's on the primary NAS, make sure you tick this box and then it may take hours, it may even take days depending on the amount of data you have. It will slowly but surely copy over the data in the exact form via that one GBE heartbeat connection between the active and the passive server. So I'm clicking the top one, but chances are you want the second one. It will then ask you to verify the identity and the login on this NAS because you are of course about to delete a lot of data on these server volumes in the creation of this cluster. So we're gonna go ahead and put the password incorrectly. Go ahead, click Submit. Confirm the settings of what you're about to do, that all data is now being removed for a brand new operation. Click Apply. Say that all, uh, confirm that all the data on the passive server will be removed and that all the data stored on the active server in my case is going to be deleted and that this operation will remove the NASes from use for a short period of time. Click Yes. And now it's going to create our brand new Synology high availability environment. Shortly, it will power down the secondary NAS on the right hand side of the screen. And this NAS will technically now not be accessible. All that will happen from this point forward once this operation is complete is the IP on the local area network will change to the one that ends in 120 and we'll only see one NAS on the network. The secondary NAS will only exist from a visible stance via the primary NAS that we are accessing. As you can see, it's now erasing the data that, that's on this primary NAS or the active server. And once that's completed, it will then clone the existing setup and environment of our primary active NAS onto that passive NAS. So that means we've got the two identical setups and ultimately we have our high availability and our dual controller environment, but externally rather than internally. Let's fast forward to the completion of the Synology high availability setup. A quick update, we can see here that our second NAS has now con has um, its connection severed and now on the network it is not going to be accessible. From this point it is going to be communicating with our primary NAS via that heartbeat connection that's being created. Now remember, in the event that our primary NAS fails and we need to switch over to our secondary passive NAS, the 922, then we are able to interact with it on the network. But always remember that its identity now will always be the cluster connection, ending in my case in dot one two zero. But once again, let's fast forward to the completion of this setup.
So now, as you can see, our Synology cluster is now being opened up there. The IP has changed. We're going to zoom out a little bit there to keep it all in screen, a little bit far there. And as you can see right there, our new cluster is in operation. It's healthy. And because we've wiped these servers, the result is it's instantaneous. And now everything is complete. You can see the CPU utilization is obviously higher on the active server. And if we go into uh, the Synology Assistant tool and search the local area network, you'll see that now only the cluster is visible with the old NAS now being completely inaccessible. Their own independent IPs still, still technically exist, but we can't access them remotely in the way that we could. So from this point, now anything we do on the primary NAS here, so if we want to go ahead and create a brand new shared folder, we have to create a new volume, we have to go ahead and create everything from scratch again, then from here, everything we do on the primary NAS will be reflected on the other NAS. So remember, if you do want to keep your old data, make sure you click to that other box earlier on. But for now, let's go ahead and create a new area of storage there. We're going to call this one 920 pool. It's going to be a RAID 1. We're going to use both of those disks. Go ahead, click Next, click OK. We're going to wipe it. And there we go. We're creating that new storage pool. And while it does that, it's now going to be transferring that information in the background onto the other device. Same goes when we create a volume. So create a brand new volume there while it creates the storage pool while it does that of course i don't know if you can hear the clicking in the background of the nazis while it goes ahead and you can see the passive server is now having the occasional spike as data is being sent between them and we can go ahead and create a new storage pool as well click custom going to existing storage pool going to use btrfs go ahead and now we're creating that storage pool and again and as well as you can see, that information is now being synchronized between the two of them. And as you can see, it is detailing that this operation of synchronization between both devices is happening in real time via that heartbeat connection. So I'm going to wrap things up here. In my next video, I am going to be conducting some um, demo testing of this SHA setup. I'm going to create some map drives, some iSCSI LUNs, that sort of thing. And then we are going to power down that first device. We're going to see what happens in the SHA within the primary and the secondary if the primary server fails and when the secondary server fails. We're going to find out how the NAS reacts to each of them in our follow-up test, so do stay tuned for that. Click like if you've enjoyed the video, click subscribe to learn more, and I will see you next time.